Hi, Lauren. Thank you so much for joining my YouTube channel today for an interview. I wanted to talk to you specifically about how you grew your CSA. But before we talk about that, I wanted to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to viewers. So can you talk a little bit about who you are, why you started growing, where are you growing, including just a little bit around is your town suburban, urban, rural, that kind of stuff. So I'll hand it over to you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Jesse. My name's Lauren Tamraz, and I'm the farmer and owner at Alchemy Farmhouse in Gardner, New York. We're in the Hudson Valley, about probably 90 minutes from the city, and we are on the west side of the Hudson River, so it tends to be a little bit more rural here. Um, we do have some larger cities that are within about 15 minutes north, south, and east of us, but probably my town and the surrounding like 20 miles are mostly i would say suburban to rural we have a lot of farms here we have flower farms veggie farms a lot of orchards there's a lot of apple farms um I, there's actually three apple farms like within a quarter mile of my house we're definitely a farm kind of place which is cool it means that we have a lot of people who appreciate farming and csas and having local foods local flowers and that makes it a pretty ideal place for growing flowers and for having a csa um, instead of just a, a wholesale flower business. Yeah, so I, I know that you actually have been interested in growing for a really long time and you are, I believe in your fourth year, right? In 2024. Can you talk about just like, how did you start growing? Sure, um, I had always kind of been a little bit of a, a crazy farmer is probably, or a crazy gardener is probably how my friends would describe me. I was a teacher uh, for a while and uh, when I wanted to leave teaching, I decided that I was going to be a market grower for veggies. And so I did that back in 2009, but for anybody who was a Hudson Valley farmer in 2009, they probably remember it was a really horrible weather year. And so I left shortly after diving into it and went back to teaching for a short while. but. Gardening went out in the end, um, and I had a hydroponics business with my husband and his best friend. And so I got to kind of teach people about gardening. So I was teaching and growing at the same time, which was really cool. And then I noticed that I really liked taking on challenges. So I would choose different things to grow in our home gardens. Uh, we also had a high tunnel, so I would sort of pick different crops each year to try to master uh maybe not that i mastered them but that i would take on as sort of pet projects and eventually i sort of ran out of any vegetables that i wanted to eat <laughs> that were new and challenging and i started growing more flowers and that was how i learned about florette and uh it coincided with the pandemic and it was sort of just a good time to have a new challenge in my life and uh previously i was we sold the hydroponics store or closed it actually and i was running a few airbnbs that we had which was cool and fun and i really liked the hospitality aspect um, i loved the design aspect and like creating spaces and creating like a, a place for people to be. But during the pandemic, it was really challenging with my kiddo. And so I wanted something that I could be based more from my house. And so I signed up for Aaron's class through Florette and I really believed I was just doing it for me. But before the class even started, and my husband was kind of like, oh yeah, really, you're gonna do this and you're not gonna like decide you're starting a farm again. And I was like, no, nah, I think, you know, I'm just, I just want to learn more about flowers. But before the class even began, I was like, oh, no, I'm lying to myself. I'm going to start a flower farm. Uh, and so that's kind of what happened. Yep. So you're in year four. Can you talk a little bit about your growing space? Clearly, we see tulips behind you and we'll get into that. But like outside, how big is your growing space? My outdoor space is not huge, but it is uh, sort of small parcels. Not, not all of them are that small, um, but essentially we live on four and a half acres and I already had 
two large established gardens. It started out as 50 by 100 feet and then we made it larger. So now it's probably about 150 feet by 50 feet. And then my front yard is smaller. It's probably about half that size. But then we have a lot of perennials. I was always big into perennials. We've lived at this property for 17 years. And so I was always putting in lilacs, hydrangeas, things like that. So especially over time, now that things have matured, even though they're not part of our regular rotation and annual growing spaces, during certain seasons, we're cutting a lot from, from like the non-grow areas. So that part always seems like a real bonus. Inside though, we have a barn where we have probably two to 4,000 tulips at a time going. So not huge, but it's, uh, it's getting bigger every year. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's 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 really awesome. So, um, I mean, you're you're realistically not growing on a large space outside. I think you're probably growing a little bit more than one and a half you times what me. I am growing on. So it's pretty cool to see that you've been able to really build like a business out of a relatively small space. And I'm assuming you're also intensively farming on that right uh, throughout the season. Uh, yes. Um... I would say I space things sometimes even closer than like the minimum recommendations. We're always trying to push limits. My goal is to never be super negligent or like super sloppy about it. But at the same time, I'm always saying like, I want to push the boundaries of how close something can be or how little care it might actually need. Um, sometimes I'm mean to plants. But I think I learn a lot from it. So let's start talking about CSAs. So can you start by talking about just how did you land on a CSA and in what year did you first start offering those? Sure. I took the floret class in the winter of 21 and decided that I was going to have the CSA spring of 21. So I didn't have a lot of time in between. And also, as you mentioned, since I'm on a small space, I knew right away I wanted to be a retail grower only. It didn't make sense to try to do things wholesale. Um, not only did I not think I would have the quantity to offer, but a little egotistical piece of me did not want to grow something beautiful and then give it to some florist to just take all the credit. Um, but also because I wanted to create something that I wanted to belong to. Uh, actually, during the pandemic, before I signed up for Floret, um, I was a part of a CSA in my area because we have awesome growers who are only wholesale, but they lost their business essentially during COVID because they were signed up, you know, to do all of these events and wholesale markets, and then nothing was going to happen anymore. So they had to pivot and they hopped on with a local veggie grower that I'm friends with to market their flowers as a CSA to those veggie CSA members. And I was so excited at the idea that I was going to learn more about these flowers that I hadn't grown before. And it was primarily, I think it was like anemone, ranunculus and Iceland poppies. And it was so cool because those were definitely things that were still on my list that I had never grown yet. It was definitely part of my inspiration. And I was, was thinking, well, these got, you know, the, the world opened back up again in 21 and they were able to start wholesaling again, but there was still no one who was doing a CSA. So I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And we're also far enough apart. Um, we have a mountain ridge here and I'm on the east side of it and they're on the west side of it. And sometimes that can be really divisive. A lot of people travel over it constantly all day, but it also sort of gives a natural separation that um, <clears throat> I don't usually have the same customers that would be going to a farm in that town. That, that's really interesting because you talked about before how you live in an area where there are a lot of farms, including other flower farmers. So it sounds like from what you're saying, um, you are the one who is filling the gap in the world of flower CSAs and like everyone is still able to kind of have their own little circle of customers or do you guys ever like overlap? I think sometimes we overlap. Um, I even have other growers that are in my CSA because <laughs> they don't grow during the winter. So I think that we're all really pretty friendly with each other or at least I, maybe I'm oblivious. <laughs> I think that we are. Um, but there's actually quite a few CSAs I can think of. There's some in Kingston, there's some across the river in Red Hook 
and they're all really cool people and really great growers. Um, we have some overlap when it comes to what we grow um, and our seasons, but for the most part, I would say our location makes us a very busy place uh, in general in the Hudson Valley. All flower farms are pretty busy because we're so close to the city and because we see a huge influx of weekend people, wedding people, things like that. So I think that there is enough room for everyone. Um, but a lot of people want to do things like weddings or they don't want to deal with the infrastructure of having a CSA. So I feel like there's space for everybody because I don't really want to do weddings and I don't really want to deal with florists. So it works out. Yeah. I, I definitely want to get into that infrastructure piece of the CSA in a bit. Can you talk about the evolution of your CSA in terms of number of shares you offer, but then also just like clearly you have a winter CSA right now, but do you have other CSAs throughout the year? Like what did that look like from year one to going on to year four? Um, in 2021, I completed the florette course, I think in like late February. And within a week or two, I had my website up. I was really lucky. I have a great friend who's a photographer. And so she came and took pictures of me in like March. We had like one warm day, but everything else was like brown. There were no leaves on the trees and we just made it work. And so I put up a few pictures and explained what the plan was you know, like a little blurb of that we were going to have all of these great flowers and it was going to be fun and join me and let's wing it together. And that was pretty much how it started. Uh, I took a picture and hung it up at our local green grocer in town where I shop and I started getting people signing up. And I have to admit, I was a little bit surprised when like the strangers would sign up. That part was exciting that someone was like, trusting me and believing that I was real deal versus like friends feeling bad and being like, should we join Lauren CSA? Well, oh, maybe no one will. We should, but it wasn't like that. So that part was cool. So and can I actually I think, ask, um, yeah. you said that you put it in a local grocer and people started yeah. signing up. Like, how do you, like, how did you logistically get people to sign up? Was it like through a website? Did they call it you? Was. Like, okay. No, no, actually I was very, very, um, deliberate with that. I still am. I think one person over the years accidentally got my phone number and that is the only person. And that's how it's staying. Like people do not like, I love our members. They can email me all day long. Nobody gets my phone number. Like I try to keep things very separate and deliberate. And I try to communicate every day the way I want to communicate moving forward because I did not want to be that person that was super lax about it at the start and then had a business that wasn't sustainable. So even when I was just starting out on like day one, it was the royal we. I said we about everything <laughs> and used the website. I didn't want to like shift gears. And sometimes that's happened. There's things that I've changed, but I really wanted to have things the way I ultimately saw them going from the start. So I had the website before I put the posters up and they signed up through Squarespace. And nice. yeah, I mean, it had fees and stuff that I wouldn't have had if I just said, why don't you Venmo me or call me and drop me off some cash at my house. But I really didn't want people doing things like that. I also really wanted a record so that that way I never messed up. And so now anybody who signs up, I'm like, oh my God, like, did I lose a CSA member? I can find what they purchased, which feels, you know, it's a big relief when you're starting to increase your numbers. I began with a, I think I budgeted with 12, no, 15 slots for the first season, um, which was supposed to be spring, summer, and fall. And I think maybe 12 people, maybe even 15 people signed up by the time I began. Um, wow. And that, that's a large number, I feel, for a, like your first time. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's just me feeling like that. I that's a large growing number. things already. So I that's kind true. of knew like that's how true. much I, could, I would have 
Um, and I had paid a lot of attention to how much I had already been cutting in the last year or two when I was growing all summer. But it was also complete leap of faith. Like I had never grown anemones or ranunculus or Iceland poppies. And I started growing them and was like, oh yeah, cool. In like six weeks, I should have these to sell to people. Whatever. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> I yeah. mean, it could have failed, but it, it didn't. So, but I'm, so I am like that. It's funny because I can be very... I really like a routine. I can be very like uh, a homebody, all those kinds of things. But when it comes to business, I'm like, ah, wing it, see what happens. I think that like some people just maybe lack the confidence in that first year to take on so many. And for someone who was somewhat of an experienced grower and kind of knew what to expect, did you have any unexpected hurdles that you ran into that first year? Or for the most part, it was oh, yeah. like what you expected? Oh, yeah. I had people who signed up for spring, people who signed up for summer, and uh, it wasn't like all at once. People started trickling in, you know, people would sign up for spring, and then spring was rolling, and then some people started to sign up for summer during the spring session, but I didn't have anyone who had signed up for autumn yet, and it's really good <laughs> because rabbits came and they, like, devoured all of my dahlias and so i closed the sign up i closed registration and i was like well no one has signed up and i'm gonna i'm gonna wait this out i'm gonna see if i can like mitigate this what i can do here um and the funny thing was i had had a dog for like 12 years and i guess just him being around i know you have a pit bull too right yeah so i think just his presence he was like a big guy right and I think that he just scared off a lot of the creatures. And I really didn't used to have too much damage in the gardens because, I don't know, not that I'm, I'm always good about closing the gate, but like they're just jerks and they find a way in or there's the area that's like way out that I'm never near. And so they're like, by the way, did you know there's been a hole here all season? We've been coming in. So he had died during COVID. And then in 21, when we had the first year of the CSA, that was when like rabbits and groundhogs just got completely insane. So I closed the registration and just kind of like tried to wing it. And I was like, no, it's not going to happen in time. And, it, and my friend was also getting married. And so I was like, you know what, forget it. Uh, we're going to cancel CSA. No one signed up, but I wrote a lot of newsletters all about how I was really sorry we were going to have to cancel that CSA so that everyone knew there was something going on. <laughs> And I, I wanted people to like think that we were bigger than we were, I guess. And I just decided all of my flowers were going to go to my friend's wedding. Okay. But at least you had a successful spring and summer, it sounds like. Yeah, it was fine. And I knew that I had the backup of other farms around here. I didn't feel bad about the idea that I might have to buy from them. I was transparent. I've had to do it before because now we've had like, we've had like 10, at least 10 CSA sessions and so there's been years where especially like the first whatever is the first season of the year like if there's no outdoor flowers because it's a really cold winter and spring or whatever like I bought from some people who had big hoop houses and things like that and then I'm always like how lucky are we this week we have ranunculus from this farm or that farm our friends at wherever and then everybody wins and it's also cool because I don't ever want our CSA members to ever think that like our farm is the only place because we all rely on each other for a lot in the Hudson Valley. And so, yeah, I think it's totally cool when I get to feature somebody else's flowers. I mean, it costs more, but it's awesome when we can give our members something great. And I never want to have a week without something, so. Yeah, and everyone wins in that scenario, right? Like, you still totally. get to offer your CSA, the mm -hmm. local farmer also gets business, and then the customer gets flowers. So yeah. I, 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 I love that you guys... beautiful flowers. I love that yes. part. But, but I just love that you guys embrace the competition and you're not necessarily competition yeah. with each other. You guys work together and it's like everyone benefits from that. Totally. So a lot of the other... so. The, some people are wholesale only and some people are primarily like weddings and farmers markets and so like 
our customers don't really overlap. Sometimes they that's do, awesome. and that's cool too. Yeah. Like I think some people who are my CSA members, if they're in like another area and they see flowers, I'm sure they buy them. Why wouldn't they? I would. Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, you said that you, you've had basically 10 seasons of CSAs at this Probably point. Probably more than so, that, but yeah. More than that. So what would you say is the highest amount that you've taken on in a single season for CSAs? Um, this year. So last year for our first tulip season, I wanted to kind of keep the numbers low. So I think I did, I did 25 or 26, uh, I even 27. Cause I think like people kept hearing about me and I felt guilty. So I let them join. Um, but I think 25 was like the goal and it was the goal for the whole year. I think I signed up 25 people for every season that we did. We did like a winter one, winter two, spring one, spring two, early summer, and then autumn dahlias. And I think we had 25 people for everything, actually, except for dahlias. I think dahlias, I was nervous because like I said, we've had rabbits issues before. Yeah, rabbits. <laughs> so I think I only did 20 because also um, I didn't want to grow a ton of stuff besides dahlias for autumn. Um, I just didn't have the space for it. So I was a little nervous about how many stems I could I could put out. So we did just 20, but it worked out well. And then we still always had extras. I try to budget so that we kind of max out what I think will grow, but still always have enough for like a bucket of extras. That makes sense. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about just how you think about pricing your CSA? Like are all the different seasons priced the same? Do you think about it like per bouquet? Like, like how does that work? Previously I was usually just pricing all the bouquets the same and so i was kind of picking a number and then allowing the flowers to reach that number you know when i was making them i think it was a little bit of balancing like what do people expect what's the going rate um how many flowers do i think i'll grow and what do i want to make i've done some work it backwards kind of formulas where I might project what we're going to, what I'd like us to sell for the year. And then if I look at the number and the number is terrible, I'm like, no, that doesn't work. We have like something has to change. We either have to have more members or higher bouquets or some other revenue stream, you know, something else going on. Um, but I wanted to add too. So we had 25 members last year. Uh, but this year I decided I wanted to increase it. So we have 45 now. You almost doubled it essentially. Uh, so well, that yeah, is- Yeah, I almost doubled our number of tulips. So I yeah. figured to create a week, 10 stems per bouquet. I did 45 and hoped that we would still harvest almost 500 a week or sometimes more than that, depending on what time of the season it was. Going back to this pricing question. So- I guess at the end of the day, like, do you make like your Dahlia subscription worth more than other summer subscription? So, so you've played around with that. Sounds like I did, especially when I decided to have less Dahlia members, I increased our price. Okay. But I think it makes sense. And I also look at it this way. My farm isn't anybody else's farm. And if you decide to shop for me, these are the prices that work for me. So. I sort of have to price things the way that it makes sense for the small scale that we grow on. I mean, I know that there's people who can sell their dahlias for like, like a dollar or two a stem. Um, not me. <laughs> so yeah, I kind of, I mean, that is almost larger... armed robbery given how much time and effort dahlias take. So just like one final question on pricing, this is like actually a question that I have, which is, yeah. So you have the value of the bouquet, right? Which kind of st sets like the standard base for what that price is going to look like. But do you add any additional dollar amount on for like the logistics and the other time to arrive at that final number? I'm starting to, I am. I'm starting to realize, especially now that I have hired two people and one of them helps me on CSA day, I'm starting to see that I need to do that. And I think that I'm, I'm in this funny time period where I haven't released my shares for spring and summer and fall. I probably do need to start accounting for things other than just stems, seeds, whatever. 
Uh, it's definitely something I've also come to the realization. Like I accounted for the delivery costs because we actually do delivery to houses, like not just like, oh, we go to a cafe and you pick up. But for on-farm pickup, I did not really account too much for extra beyond the bouquet. And that was honestly a mistake because the logistics of running a CSA can be very time consuming. And this is where, when I think about 45 shares, like that to me is mind blowing because that's 45 people who ultimately you have to make sure they pick up their bouquets. And if they don't, then there's usually like an email at the minimum going back and forth, right? So nope. like, that's there's not, right. okay. I. Nope. I want to hear more about this. So, sure. okay. So, so maybe we take a step back um, because you work with like cafes and other small businesses for drop off, right? Do you also have an on farm pickup? Yes. So we, we have three okay. locations. We have the farm and then we have about 10 minutes north of us. We have Lagusta's chocolate shop, which is amazing. And then about another 15 minutes north of that, we have Sweet Maurice's Bakery in Kingston, New York, and everything gets brought there. I send out a newsletter literally like right before the flowers get there and everybody gets told what to expect that day. They get onboarded with emails as soon as they sign up that, and it actually, I'm this year I made a, it's a checkbox, but there's a checkbox in the registration that says like, I get it. I'm responsible for this. I have to pick up. And if I don't, that's my problem. And also things go wrong. These are plants. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I don't hold Lauren responsible. And nobody has ever like gotten mad at me really before. So I didn't put that as a result of like some horrible, you know, situation, but I just started to realize that that was the best thing moving forward, especially now with so many new members. But no, the very first day, if someone is a new member, I will usually remind them if they haven't picked up. However, beyond that, no way. Like, that's on you. You're all adults. I hope you love your flowers. I told you from day one, send a friend. You're away, send a friend. Yeah, no, I love that. So what is the logistics with the the shop look like? Um, like, do they contact you at the end of the day and say, hey, like nope. two bouquets. So it's just like you drop off and you're done. You're like mm -hmm. until yep. the week after. Yep. Wow. Okay. There's, and so, there's so far, a like, and that's really yep. it. There's a checklist. There's a laminated sign that has a QR code to find out about us because it, it, we had too many people who were like trying to buy them. And so I had to be like, stop, these are prepaid. They belong to the members of our CSA. Here's how you can find out more. Um, yeah, cause they're a busy cafe. So sometimes people would just pick them up and be like, I'm buying these. And they'd have to be like, oh, no, you're not. And that was awkward. Got it. So yeah, to start doing that. So, but I would yeah. usually check in like on Thursday or Friday at some point and say like, hey, is there still anything sitting there? And then, but the, I mean, the rule of thumb has always been that the cafe can just have them. It sounds like for the most part, it works. Like you haven't really gotten complaints or, and everyone is an adult who signs up. So it's, yeah. it's good that you've trained your customers that that is the expectation. That's the and key. my takeaway is I need to do that too. <laughs> oh my so. God. Do you listen to Corinna Bench? I'm pretty sure that's who I learned it from. I do. I do. You have to I train your do. members, train them and know what the rules yeah. are so that everybody's happy. I guess for you, the jump from, we'll call it like 25 to 45, wasn't at all significant from the CSA logistics side. It was more just the growing side. Like that's the piece where you really had to like focus more on, right? And spend more effort. Um, it is bigger though, because I do, I email a lot. I send an email every week and I always welcome people to reply to it. So I'm, and our email list has about 320 people, even though we only have 45 members right now. Some of those are previous members or just local community people who like to buy flowers. And so I'm always saying, oh yeah, like hit reply, tell me about this this week or whatever. And so I do end up emailing with a lot of people. Um, we also seem to have an uncanny knack for getting members with the same name, sometimes even the same last initial. And then you're like, oh good, it's 
KDB and KDB and KDB and they all are at the same pickup spot and you try to like I like I'm like okay KDB who has the dog KDB who does this KDB who has a kid and you have to like remember who's who um but I feel like being a teacher helped me with that I kind of knew how to keep weird memory things about everybody um so I'm not gonna say it wasn't harder to have 45 it is harder <laughs> especially when um like we certainly have had 45 people that I did already know. So if they had all signed up, that could be easier. But at least, usually at least 20% are new members every season. And because we had a new location, all of them were new. And so mm. I had to start from scratch. All of those people were like brand new people who didn't necessarily understand what we were doing. And I had to answer a lot of questions for them. So speaking of which, then, if you get 20% new members every, we'll call it CSA cycle, how do you do your marketing? I started putting in my newsletter, like saying like, hey, friend referrals. So far, I haven't actually done anything to be like, thank you for referring your friends. But it is part of my plan for this year. And we've only had a few people who have like legitimately done it on our website. But um, we definitely get people as friend referrals. Uh, I went and walked around and met people in our new location city, which I hadn't done probably since we started in 2021. And I walked around and I had nice flyers and smiled and chatted with lots of people. And wow. it, I mean, it, it worked. We had some signups just from that. And then after a few days, it kind of quiets down, but I had left flyers, I had left postcards in all those businesses. And so then people that I hadn't met that day started seeing those things. And so that helped a lot. Um, I didn't do, I didn't do grocery store flyers this winter, but you know, I did put them in our pickup locations, which helps, you know, t I tag sometimes in our stories like for the new new location i tagged um like local entities that repost stuff for that area and things like that and so i think that helped a little bit for some of them but i love this because you're going back to like the basics of marketing I had to. like yeah like, it was like going it was, it was out a fun challenge yeah yeah, yeah. it's cool but but you don't or I, I mean i'm sure it happens every day but a lot of people i think believe that social media might be the only route because they see other people doing that right no it but meanwhile be. you know people no. like you're going on the street and talking to people and it's oh, still yeah. effective oh, it's definitely it's super effective especially if you have flowers i happened to go visit in december during the very brief window when we had nothing um so i just had to bring a really pretty flyer of flowers but ordinarily i always recommend that generosity goes really far so take a bucket of your flowers go meet people like always have something to leave with your name on it and that's how we got a lot of our first signups back in 2021 i went and visited businesses with like little tiny like half dozen bunches of whatever was growing that week and it made a really big difference and i think it's just nice because if you go in just hoping to meet people tell them what you're doing and leave them a little gift i mean that's awesome don't go in expecting like don't go in and with your sign up clipboard and say like, so did you want to sign up? You know, you just have to go in and like talk to people and let them know you exist and things come back to you for sure. Can we talk a little bit about just how did you find the businesses who you partner with today for your CSA locations and what that initial conversation looked like with them? Sure. Um, I did get very lucky. The first business that we worked with is someone that I've known for a long time. We we are not super close and we weren't then either. We're just kind of like two cool business ladies that happen to have some stuff in common. Um, and so we knew each other for a long time and I was a customer of hers because her chocolate is amazing. And so I used to go in all the time. So I had that on my side. I was someone that she already knew and I was um, a very good customer, but she didn't have to say yes. You know, I mean, she loved flowers. And so the idea that uh, she wouldn't have to do very much, but she'd get flowers every week, I think was pretty enticing. 
And she could have always decided to stop, you know, like I think she knew that too. And because she's such a smart business person, she knows that like having anybody extra in the door is a great idea or doing something that helps somebody else's business is just a good thing to put out into the world. And so I'm really grateful that I was that little business then. Um, and I always try to like share her things on social media. I mean, they are huge in our town and they also ship nationwide. So I don't really think she needs my help, but at the same time, I still want to give it, you know, I, I believe in what they do. And, um, I think a lot of the same people who love local flowers also want to go and have amazing vegan ethical like uber uber organic homemade chocolate i think what i heard from you is that people recognize that when you have a cs or when you're partnering with a flower farm as a csa drop-off destination that obviously they're not only bringing you beauty in the form of a bouquet a free bouquet to display but that there is that traffic that's coming in and if if you're running a business, it's pretty clear that that's going to be beneficial for you, right? So like, it sounds like she never said to you, hey, like, can I get a cut of this, right? It was just like, oh, yeah, like, let's make this a no. dual arrangement. Yeah. yeah. Well, just like I was saying about wanting to keep communication, like with my members really strict from the beginning, I wanted to have very clear guidelines also with my host sites. And so, yeah, I... I think I asked them in my head and in my heart, I wanted to just have it be like, I will give you a bouquet a week. And um, when I have something nice, I'll be generous and I'll share it with you. But I asked and said, does that sound good to you? Do you want more? Do you want something else out of it? They could have told me they wanted something more. And I also could have considered it and said yes or no, but they didn't. Any person I've ever asked, even when I've done pop-ups, I've asked, like, is there something that, you know, that you would like in return for me doing this? Um, people always just say, oh, I think a bouquet is enough. Like, I think people really have always seen the value in, in getting to have some of our flowers, which I'm very thankful for that. And it's really cool that people enjoy them enough that, um, that I'm able to, to barter with flowers. Especially yeah, since that's, they're that's, perishable. It's not like they're bringing home something that feeds their family or sits on a shelf or they get to wear it or whatever. They're awesome. And then they're dead in a week. But yeah, that journey in between is amazing. So let's talk about just the popularity of the different seasons that you offer. Sure. Uh, is, is your winter share the most popular or is it just, yes. oh, it is. Okay. Yes. So and, and I think that that's probably just like a no-brainer because no one else has flowers this time of year, right? Yes. It w I would be lying if I said that <laughs> isn't why I'm doing winter flowers. 100% that is a very large part of why I'm doing winter flowers because then I don't even have to worry about anyone being in competition. I mean, not that no one else does that because, I mean, there are some people, but then I'm not worrying that the other farms care or like caring about what our outlets are like, okay, it's okay that I'm doing a CSA because they're doing weddings. No, nobody really has flowers. So I don't have to be concerned about stepping on anyone's toes. But you know what? I meant to add this too. When we were talking about how you arrange with a host site, I think it's really important not only to lay out and make sure that they are very comfortable with what you are going to provide them for being the host site because they have so much that they're incurring that I'm not. I mean, I'm walking in, putting something down and that's about it. And that's kind of amazing, right? They're paying for all this stuff to run their business and I'm leaving something there for somebody to come get it. It's great. But I also, I train my members. Like every newsletter says like, oh, this week at you know, at the chocolate shop, I'm super, you know, when it's summertime, I'm like, oh my God, they have their ice cream sandwiches back. Did you get an ice cream sandwich at your pickup? Like, please make sure you're really nice to everybody. Like that is very important to me. We're guests there. And if I ever find out that like, I hope I never, I hope I never have a member who's like ever rude to a host site because that member has to go. I'm not, I'm not okay yeah. with that. So they have to treat everyone who works at the site like 
they are a guest in their space and they are. So I, I try to make it really clear with them that we're very grateful for our relationship that we have there. And I know that not everybody can maybe spend extra money beyond the flower pickup every week to buy something at the site, but I want them to. <laughs> I yeah. think that would be a nice thing. And when I was the drop-off person, which I was every single day until last week, I bought something every week. So you must be relieved that you're no longer driving and dropping off flowers. <laughs> yes and no. Yes and no. Um, I am bummed that I'm not there for my old favorite customers that I used to love to see. Some of them... Uh, because it's in like a walking part of town, a lot of them were people who worked at local businesses and they would all take their break and walk down to pick up their flowers and get a treat and say hello. And because I didn't stay at pickup, I wouldn't see too many people, but there were a lot of them that would plan to come when I would arrive and I would say hi and see how everybody was doing and get to see customers holding flowers, which I don't get to see as much when I'm at home on the farm. But it wasn't going to work logistically with the school bus and with having a secondary site. And I was trying to figure out, okay, someone is going to have to get the flowers earlier than I was used to doing it because I don't have enough time to get to both places. And, what, and I was like, you know what? If I need help, this should be something I need help with. Like, don't feel bad hiring somebody for something I can do. There's been a lot of that in my life. Like, yeah, I can do it, but just because I can spend three hours washing buckets, is that really the best place for my brain in the business? Not always. Totally agree. Time. And and another thing that I think you just highlighted, which I didn't really think about, was just how you've almost built a community around your CSA as a forum for people yeah, to actually. That's what I wanted. To, I, I wanted to, to see have each other. Like a, yeah, I totally wanted a thing like that. And some of the people know each other and some of the people have met each other. I don't have too many events because I don't have a big picturesque farm like people probably picture in their mind. Um, it's at my house <laughs> and my kid is there and my dog is there and my husband's big work truck is there. <laughs> it's not like, uh, you know, this beautiful you pick kind of site, but I still like to invite people here like once or twice a year. And I'm working on the logistics of organizing that more for 2024 and having help will, I think, enable that more too. Would you say that your CSA is your primary means of selling your flowers? 100%, yeah. Well, not 100%, yes, but it's probably, <laughs> I'd say it's like, 80 to 90% of what we make usually. I do a small farm stand uh, and it's typically just stocked CSA day and the day after. It's whatever were the extras from CSA. And I try to, you know, have like, I try to concentrate my harvests. Well, not so much with the tulips during the winter, but especially when it's outdoor stuff, you know, I'll do it like two to three days a week. And so I kind of lump everything in together. But in the summertime, when we didn't have CSA last year, it was kind of interesting because I still tried to do like a weekly flower stand um, and I didn't have a CSA and it still worked out. I didn't have as many. I wasn't doing like 25 bouquets a week. I was doing less than that, but I had expected it to be less. And it was interesting having more of a rolling income versus everything sort of coming in all at once throughout the winter as like preseason sales. Just make sure everyone understands your CSAs are weekly, right? Like you're not doing it every other week. Every Wednesday. Okay. And actually that's probably a good thing to talk about too. Yeah, it's a Wednesday, which is a weird day. The first year it was a Friday and I was like, wow, how much do I hate this? I felt like every weekend I was exhausted and just like trying to do something on a day that was convenient for everybody else. And so the second year I was like, hmm, what's a day that I'm probably never gonna have family plans? Wednesday, that's CSA day now. And everybody is trained that knows me now, it's Wednesday, that's the day. And people are always like, I'm only here on the weekend. Can I get flowers on Saturday? And my answer is always the same, maybe. Like if we have flowers that day, then maybe. I say, sign up for my newsletter. That's what I tell every single person. Sign up, 
when there's flowers, I send out a message and it's usually because I send it on Wednesdays. But if I have a lot of stuff for a weekend, I would love for you to come and buy flowers on Friday or Saturday. But scheduling the CSA to be then was highly stressful, especially if you do have, you know, like anybody who has an issue and has to like come the next day. It, I don't allow it usually ahead of time, like somebody to say, I'd really like to join, but I can only come on this day. But, you know, sometimes something comes up and so someone, especially for who has like a farm pickup, they'll have to come on Thursday. But in the old life, that would have meant Saturday. And that was a pain in the butt. So right from the start, if you are starting a CSA, pick a day you really like that you're not gonna wanna do something fun. That is your CSA day. And if anybody thinks it's a weird day and not the day they want flowers, you just tell them like, isn't it so wonderful that now that's the day you're gonna get flowers? You just have to spin it. I love it. I mean, that was actually the last question I wanted to ask you, which was what's like, what is some advice you would give to someone who wants to start a CSA and never has done it? So would it be that one? Or do you have anything else that you would encourage them to do or think about? I think that anybody who, well, if they haven't done any growing yet, that is tricky. Sometimes people always say like, don't have a CSA your first year. I did, but I had growing experience and I knew I had the backup of other really great farms in the area if I didn't have flowers one week. So if you also have experience and you have like a wholesale farm that you are willing to buy flowers from, then I would say wing it. You can totally have a CSA your first season. Don't have huge numbers or you might make yourself nuts while you get used to it. But CSA in general, I would say you just have to be, you have to want to make something that you would want to be a part of, right? And I loved the idea that I was going to like go pick up flowers every week. Like who wouldn't want that? Think of how wonderful it would make your life to see flowers all the time and to have the special time to go get them. I think people take that for granted and it's just about having the bouquet, but I think it's actually about believing that going to pick up flowers is an important enough part of your schedule. Most people tell me when they get here, if they're farm pickup people, like that they are happy to be there. This, this week it was really way too cold and I couldn't leave the tulips outside. So I put a sign in their normal spot by the barn that they had to go knock on my door. And whenever, and I recognize that's not convenient for a lot of people. Some people are like, I don't wanna be in someone's house. Some people are like, I don't wanna talk to anybody. And so when everybody came to the door, I apologized and I said, it's really nice to see you, but I'm sorry for the inconvenience this week. Every single person, there's like 15 people, they all said, no, this is really nice. I'm actually glad that I had to do something different today. I'm glad that I got to talk to you. I'm glad I got to stop my day to go get flowers. So don't underestimate that. Make it nice when people come to pick their things up. We have like little signs, like cute things when people pick up. Sometimes I make cookies. My son thinks it's awesome, so he likes to help and we make cookies. Also because if you pick up in Kingston, there's an amazing bakery. And if you pick up in New Paltz, there's an amazing chocolate shop. So I don't want it to be like, you know, <laughs> The red missing out child's location. We pick up a gardener and there's nothing but flowers. Not that that's a bad thing, but so sometimes I try to sweeten the deal. It's also the spot where you can pick up extras, which is good because a lot of times people want to pick up something for a friend. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to have a CSA, you should want to join a CSA. And if you don't want to join a CSA, then you probably shouldn't be creating one. I think you have to have a certain personality. You have to be willing to talk to people. You have to be willing to communicate throughout the week, but there are ways to set it up that you have really clear boundaries and people will respect that and they will wanna be a part of it. If you're very loosey goosey, it's just like having kids that have no rules. People freak out. So setting up the rules, I think actually makes them more comfortable. So build it the way you want it to be from the start. What a great and way to just summarize and wrap it. Yeah, like wrap what you just said, like be in control is basically what you just said. Yeah, and be really nice to your host site, like as generous as you can be. It's never wrong to be generous. People appreciate it. 
they will remember you for good things. And even when you mess up, if you are generous, I think you'll feel good about how things turned out. Thank you so much for giving a good portion of your afternoon for this interview, Lauren. Uh, I personally learned a lot from this. There are a lot of things that I think I need to now tweak with my CSA going forward. And I hope that others have the same takeaway. I mean, I just feel like that sometimes when you start out, you're a lot more likely to cater to what other people want. Um, but no for catering. you, it's no, it's like, this is what I need to do in order to run the business the way that I need to. And like you stick with yeah. it. And I think some people are afraid of losing customers, but to your point, like those customers are not your people, right? And they will end exactly. up being a bigger headache than they are, um, or, you know, in the long run, right? So. You can make your people, right? Like your people might be like-minded and they may want to join up with you, but if they can't follow your guidelines, they're not your people, truly. So, and also people don't always believe me when I say this, but I am an introvert. I like to talk to people, but I also mostly want to be somewhere with a book and no one is talking to me. Not even my son, not my husband, no one. Like, go away. <laughs> and just leave me with the flowers. So people are like, then how do you do a CSA? But you do it with rules. Art. And being consistent is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Lauren.